Much of the world's attention has been captured by the efforts to find the submersible Titan, which went missing while taking tourists down to see the famous sunken wreck of the ocean liner RMS Titanic on Sunday. While hopes of a positive outcome have now evaporated, the situation inevitably recalls another incident, back in 1973, when a similar-sized submersible, Pisces III, was rescued from the seabed in what is still the deepest successful rescue of its kind in history. Before looking at the rescue of the Pisces III, the latest situation in regards the Titan, originally reported missing about 435 miles south of St. John's, Newfoundland, seems to indicate the move from a search and rescue effort to one of recovery. According to the U.S. Coast Guard, a debris field that was discovered today within the search area, by a remotely operated vehicle ROV, is consistent with a catastrophic implosion of the vessel. Both titanium ends of the pressure hull were found amid the debris, located around 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic. Even if the Titan had been found still intact, the submersible could have been located as deep as around 12,500 feet, where the Titanic wreck lies. Rescuing a submerged vessel from even a tenth of this depth is difficult. But, as the Pisces III incident shows, it's not impossible. Developed by Vickers Oceanics, the Canadian Pisces III was a six-foot diameter deep-sea submersible and, as of August 29, 1973, was being used to lay transatlantic telephone cable on the Atlantic seabed, on behalf of the British Post Office. The two crew aboard were pilot Roger Chapman, a former Royal Navy submariner, aged 28 at the time, and engineer-slash-pilot Roger Mallinson, 35. The Pisces III began its dive as normal, at 1.15 a.m. on August 29, 150 miles off the coast of Cork, West Ireland. It took about 40 minutes to sink down to not far off 1,600 feet and a bit faster to get back up, Chapman subsequently told the BBC. We do eight-hour shifts, going along the surface of the seabed at half a mile an hour setting up pumps and jets which liquefied the mud, laying cable, and making sure it was all covered. It was very slow, murky work. It was like driving down the motorway in thick fog and trying to follow a white line you had to concentrate beyond belief, Mallinson recalled. One pilot would have the controls for the sub in one hand and the manipulator a mechanical hand, which would lift, twist, extend, and move sideways in the other, then we'd swap," he explained. It was also uncomfortable. We had to kneel, with our heads by our knees. Mallinson, however, was even more fatigued than usual, having not slept for 26 hours before this dive, so that he could run repairs on the submersible, which had received some damage to one of its manipulators, during a previous dive.as part of the repair work, Mallinson also decided to switch out the oxygen tank for a new one. This was by no means easy, due to the weight of the tank, and Mallinson recalled later that it wasn't actually a prerequisite of the next scheduled dive. The crew could have begun their August 29th dive without changing the oxygen supply, since, at around half full, it should have been plenty enough for their plan work. The Pisces III was back on the surface of the Atlantic when, at 9.18 a.m., things went badly wrong, while waiting for the tow line to be attached to the submersible and lifted back onto the mothership, the Vickers Voyager, the two crew suddenly felt themselves thrown backward as the Pisces III now dangled upside down. The submersible's design included a separate watertight aft sphere containing the machinery. But the tow line had apparently snagged the hatch on the aft sphere and water had rushed in, flooding it, 
and adding around a ton of weight to the Pisces III.AS, the submersible plunged into the depths, jolting them around, the crew watched helplessly as the pressure gauges spun around and items broke loose. As we sank my biggest worry was whether we were anywhere near the continental shelf, because if we hit it we'd be crushed, Chapman recalled the crew shut down the electrical systems, leaving them in total darkness and jettisoned a 400-pound weight to make the craft lighter. After around 30 seconds, the Pisces III hit the seabed, coming to rest at 1,575 feet at 9,30 m. Chapman and Mallinson couldn't be sure of how deep they were, since they had turned the depth gauge off at 500 feet, concerned that it might have exploded. As it was, the Pisces III impacted the seabed at 40 miles per hour, a considerable speed, but the crew protected themselves from the impact with cushions and put cloth in their mouths, so they didn't bite their tongues off. With only a torch for light, Chapman and Mallinson considered themselves lucky to be alive at this point. They didn't know that their craft was also wedged in a gully, meaning it was half below the seabed. Pisces III was able to make telephone contact with the surface and let them know they were okay. At this point, there were 66 hours of oxygen left on board, with eight already having been used in the dive so far. With the submersible almost upside down, Chapman and Mallinson now made efforts to try and stabilize the situation as best they could, as well as check for possible leaks. They also did the best they could to conserve oxygen above all, by now doing as little as possible, limiting physical movements, and even talking as little as possible. Already, the situation on board Pisces III was becoming seriously unpleasant foul, heavy air gathered at the lowest part of the hull, so the crew tried to remain as high above it as they could. They were also cold and wet and Mallinson was still suffering from a bout of food poisoning brought on by a horrible meat and potato pie. Meanwhile, far above them, the rescue effort was now underway.